They spray our skies Interact with these with the magnetic toxic chemicals. Space travel is space Mars rover is a I'm Rich Lund, and welcome to another episode of Debunk the Funk, and I'm very excited to bring this one to you. In the two most recent episodes of Debunk the Funk, we've been examining how the flat earth idea tries to handle gravity. In Debunk the Funk number 11, we explained why the flat earth idea is incompatible with the force of gravity. That even if an earth were flat, due to mass attracting mass, gravity would pull the matter into the most stable position, minimizing distance, producing the most compacted three-dimensional shape possible. In other words, a flat earth cannot exist if gravity exists because gravity would pull the flat earth into a sphere. How then do flat earth proponents reconcile their beliefs with that of gravity? That objects attract other objects and that this is why objects fall to the earth. In terms of why objects fall to the earth, episode number 11 examined the most common flat earth go-to explanation that gravity doesn't exist and that's not why objects fall, but that it's all about density somehow. So in that episode, a demonstration was set up that established that there is indeed a force in the downward direction, and it did so in a way that density is useless to explain. Episode number 11 debunked the flat earth density explanation for gravity, showing that it can only handle certain cherry-picked situations, but falls apart under other easily observable situations. Another, admittedly less common flat earth explanation for gravity recognizes that yes, there is a force of attraction for all objects in the downward direction, but that that force is not gravity. Instead, the force of attraction is due to all objects, including the earth, having a charge, and that the attractive force is somehow due to these charges. In Debunk the Funk number 12, using what we can already know about electric charges from first-hand experience, I showed how a charge explanation for gravity cannot be true, equipped with just a balloon and some pieces of paper. Well, now it's time to look at an area of Flat Earth's denial of gravity that they do all seem to agree upon. If you've never seen it or just need a quick review, here's the equation that describes Newton's law of gravitational force. The force of gravity, two objects will both experience, is a product of the two objects' masses and will be inversely proportional to the square of their distance apart. When it comes to the strength of gravity, mass matters and closeness matters. So now that that's been reviewed, well, that's what Flat Earth seems to unanimously reject. They feel that Newton's law of gravitation is a lie, that it cannot be observed, you would not be able to demonstrate in a at-home or classroom setup, mass attracting mass. Well, here's where the Cavendish experiment comes in. The gist of it is to have two masses hung in a way that is referred to as a torsion balance. The masses are hung in a way that allows them to be balanced, but also allows the entire balance to be relatively free to rotate. The two hanging masses then are never motionless in their little bit of rotation, but efforts are still made to minimize what could disturb their motion. When they are motionless enough, high density masses should, in theory, be able to be placed close enough to the hanging masses to show an obvious gravitational force of attraction. I was significantly impressed with two videos by a fellow science teacher, Andrew Bennett. He has two very well done, well explained videos on the Cavendish experiment, and he shows all the steps involved, so that way anybody who wished to could reproduce his experiment. I think that those two videos together already showcase very effective, understandable, empirical evidence of gravitational attraction. But Andrew Bennett inspired me. For his experiment, he used bowling balls. I knew that I had access to lead bricks. Used to make movable radiation blocking walls, I knew the educational outreach of a facility that uses them. And I was able then to get two on loan for my Cavendish experiment. I reasoned that if bowling ball material was already enough to get convincing results of gravitational attraction, then lead bricks, the effects would only be more pronounced. Newton's law of gravity qualitatively predicts that if we have a Cavendish setup that is sensitive enough and use high density masses, we should be able to observe mass attracting mass. Let's get into the classroom. Welcome to my classroom. And what I have behind me here is my attempt to reproduce the Cavendish experiment. 
For my setup, what I have are two meter sticks which have been taped together. And on either end of these two meter sticks, held there with some paper clips, are two one kilogram masses on each end. Now this meter stick is being hung by a copper wire which runs all the way up to the top of this very large piece of wood which I have separated out and have supported up on lab tables with some physical science and AP chemistry textbooks. I'm here on a Sunday and I've let this hang here since Friday when I left the building. It has been relatively undisturbed. During a school day, and even after students have left, there's so many people opening and closing doors in the building and moving through the hallways that plenty of air currents are produced. And this experiment is quite sensitive to air currents. And that's also why, as I talk about this, I'm showing you plenty of footage with a clock in the background so that way you can see by just sliding that YouTube bar how much or how little movement is actually happening. And before we do the experiment, we're going to get plenty of footage too as to the lack of movement prior to adding the masses compared to the movement that we have after adding the masses. And so for the masses, this is a lead brick. And I'll be massing this in a little bit here so you can see just how heavy we're talking about. But uh, 25, 30 pounds, somewhere around there, I'm, I'm just guessing. Mm. Because of the large amount of mass, but also in a smaller volume, I should be able to get these bricks pretty close to those weights, those masses that are hanging there, and then the results should be very obvious. So before we begin, let's check out how heavy these bricks are. I turned off and on the scale so that way now it is re-zeroed out, so it's not even registering the mass of these plastic bags. Let's put a lead brick in. I've always done this with two hands. I've never been like holding it while I do it. I want to get this all on footage, of course. Oh. Okay. And it's holding. And we're at about 12.03 kilograms. Yeah. Get a workout doing this. So. That's about a little bit over 26 pounds, but not 27 pounds yet. My mental math is correct. When it comes to a Cavendish experiment, it's not just about how much mass you use. It's also about how much volume it's taking up. If you had something really large and massive like a car, well, that also takes up a whole lot of volume. And when it comes to gravitational effects, it's not just about the mass. It's also about the distance squared between the two objects. So yes, you want something very massive, but you also want it to take up not too much space, so that way you can get the hanging masses over there on the Cavendish experiment to be able to get close to the center of mass of your objects. Without further ado, the Cavendish experiment.
there you have it, the Cavendish experiment, recreated in a classroom setting. Now I'm going to pack up my stuff and head home. I'll meet you there and we'll talk about it. From the downward angle, we can see the torsion balances amplitude. This is the noise in the experiment. So a torsion balance is always going to have some amount of noise, some amount of rotation amplitude that comes with its setup due to imperfections in conditions, imperfections in the setup. In getting the first preliminary motion of our torsion balance, we can see how far counterclockwise and how far clockwise it was normally moving. From the left-hand side of the torsion balance, you could say the lowermost limit and the uppermost limit. That represents the amplitude, the noise, in our experiment. When the lead bricks are put in place, the torsion balance was already moving counterclockwise. Yet, notice it does not reach the previous maximum counterclockwise position. If there was no attraction to the lead bricks, then adding the lead bricks should not have prevented in any way, shape, or form the torsion balance from just continuing on to that maximum counterclockwise position. Already moving counterclockwise, when the lead bricks are placed, the torsion balance slows down, doesn't reach the previous maximum counterclockwise position, slows down and changes direction, and begins then moving towards the lead bricks. The only way in physics that this can be occurring is that the torsion balance is being accelerated in the clockwise direction. An acceleration on a mass is due to a force. The lead bricks are exhibiting a force of attraction on the masses of the torsion balance. This is the gravitational effect of the lead bricks disrupting the previous equilibrium. Continue to watch though and the effect is even more obvious and pronounced. In high speeds, once the very dense lead bricks are brought in, the masses of the torsion balance are observed to be physically drawn to them. The faster we play back the footage, the more blatantly obvious it is. From the side view, the evidence is again compelling. This is an observable force of attraction between objects. This is gravitational force. Beautiful. Observable. Empirical. Gravitational force. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Debunk the Funk. I want to thank Andrew Bennett again for the inspiration, and I want to thank you for checking this out. I'm Rich Lund, and I'm here to remind you, the world needs critical thinkers. Make sure you're one of them.